you have since 2015 raised over a billion dollars in investment for your clients and you've also since 2015 done a whole lot in sale there's a young investor there's a young business owner there's an entrepreneur with an idea and they don't want to use their own money they're thinking of getting investment what is your advice to this person do they jump head first into getting investment do they perhaps try to get a minimum viable product where they get a sample out and say all right we definitely have something working this is what we're making at this price for this person because we have this data here or do they try to bootstrap and say all right because the mvp works the minimum viable product works let's slowly grow what do you say to keep thinking about seeking investment for their business at this time that was really the main drive. And I think a lot of that comes from my childhood. You're right, I was definitely not born with a spoon in my mouth. My dad was self-employed and had his own uh, business and he worked his butt off. And my mom uh, had job after job after job. And we didn't have a lot of money. And at one point we actually got kicked out of our house and we were homeless for a, a short period of time and relying on the goodwill of friends and, and others. And uh, we didn't have a place to live for a while. And I'll never forget that. And I see a pattern here where those who are resilient and they've decided that it's going to be success in one form or the other, they've made it through. The real world is one of the best educations you can get. So it's, you know, the school of hard knocks. Um, but at some point, everybody's going to be dealt a blow that makes them feel like they just get knocked down. And that's, it's really a humbling experience when that happens. I think it happens to everybody who's successful. Brian Tracy talked about an, uh, a study they did a long time ago, and out of all these multi-millionaires and billionaires they'd interviewed, they asked them how many times they'd all failed, and the average number of times that these people had failed in business, not just like little failures, things didn't work out very well or whatever, like actual businesses shut down, business completely failed, fell apart, was 11 times. Right? So they lost their businesses upwards of 11 times on average. I mean, some people maybe lost 20 times before they actually really became successful. Some of the lessons that you've learned, and I even want to mention Robert Kiyosaki in his book, uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad, he joined the Navy as a pilot. And I'm not sure you've met Robert, correct? Yeah, yeah, I know Robert. Um, yeah, he was a Marine back in the Vietnam era. So uh, Robert and I share, he's, he's actually, in 2003, mm -hmm. um, I was on deployment and actually it was 2002 i was on deployment i read that book i read rich dad poor dad for the first time and so at that point the book was only about five years old and i had read it and it changed my life right so it was at that point that i began my entrepreneurial journey but i wasn't an entrepreneur yet right i just had these great ideas and the funny thing about life in general is that you know we can read as much as we want we can read the words we can go to school we can ingest the knowledge we can think we really understand it. and i've done that a lot I've, I've read more than i think most people do but the fact is just because you learn something doesn't mean that you're going to be good at it or you're going to be able to apply it properly so you have to get your marketing your sales and your operations all completely aligned and i would say that that's where you find the companies that really scale is when they figure out how to align the message they send out in the marketing to the sales presentations and the closing that they're doing to all of a sudden a seamless streamlined delivery of the operations and the service delivery on the back end that's how you scale a company and so what you need to become is that architect that owner and that leader inside of your business sounds like you never were the rich kid with the spoon in his mouth that oh gosh no. you never had to get out there <laughs> what was your drive so if hard work is not really getting you all the results you want and then working for other people is not getting you all the results you want then there's got to be something else that maybe we should be doing and again that's where sort of uh, robert kiyosaki's philosophy made it all make sense for me, right if you could do it all over again from scratch you are looking at yourself at 12 years old and you're saying well i'm not going to be going into baseball anymore or even, you know what, let's put it just after high school, just before you join the Navy, you're looking at yourself and you say, you know what, I want to go into business, I want to own my own business, I want to invest in a few, I think I'll sell some, this is the life I want to live. What do you tell yourself at this stage that's going to keep you going through everything that you've been through?
help us help you if you're excited about today's episode then hit the like and subscribe button to help us grow the more of this episode you watch you comment you hit like and you subscribe the bigger the channel grows the bigger the channel grows the bigger the guests get the bigger the guests get the more value you'll be able to get from every episode so help us help you by hitting like and subscribing and sharing this episode with your friends and family. Thank you. Let's get to the episode. Hey guys, welcome to the Boardroom Podcast. Today we have a rather brilliant and outstanding guest with us. Today we have Jeff Barnes. And not only just the Jeff Barnes, the Jeff Barnes, two <laughs> times international best sell. No, let me not take away all the credit from him. Jeff Barnes, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Jabez. Nice to meet you. Thanks so much for having me on this podcast. It's an honor, really. I am an avid reader, so when I read two-time international best-selling author, my mind just went, wow. So <laughs> here's what I really want to do. Let's just get right into it. Scenario, I love to ask guests on the podcast. You and I, we're friends. We're going down the road. Where's your favorite city? Where's my favorite city? Oh, geez. Yeah. You know, mm. I went to Dubai last year for the first time. That was a blast. I really enjoyed doing that. Oh, awesome. So you and I, friends, walking down the street in Dubai, I see one of my friends coming, and I say to my friend, friend, this is Jeff Barnes. You might have heard of him. And he says, no, not really. I'm not familiar. And I said, well, this is Jeff Barnes. Jeff Barnes, this is friend. Who exactly in this moment is friend meeting? So, you know, if we're, if we're just hanging out and you want to introduce me to somebody else, then, you know, and here's Jeff, here's what he does. Yeah, Jeff, Jeff's an author. Really, a lot of what gets people excited is when uh, somebody says, yeah, he used to run a nuclear power plant on a submarine and he's, you know, runs all this technology and does all these innovation things. Um, that's, that's a lot of, uh, you know, what gets people excited when they're talking to me about my history and my experience. Um, but a lot of the times, you know, we're just talking about, what's happening in the world today, the things that we're, we're going through and then scaling businesses up. So you started out in the Navy or was it the Marines? Because I knew you worked in a no, submarine. I was a, I was a submariner in the Navy. Yeah. So sometimes that gets a little bit uh, confusing for some people, but I, re- I ran a nuclear power plant and all the, the engines, the turbines, the pumps and rotors and everything like that um, in a submarine for the U.S. Navy. For the U.S. Navy. And then from there, Mm -hmm. you've gotten on to do, well, your own businesses. You've helped other businesses grow. You've been, uh, I wouldn't say necessarily just a mentor, but you've been a consultant helping other businesses on their path to success in a consultancy um, capacity is the word I'm looking for. And you've also written two New York Times bestselling books. Now, the, the idea here is that you've lived perhaps two or three lives at this stage. Most people do one of the three that you've done. They either wrote a book, they either got married and have kids and they're a happy father and and husband, or they've gone and they've served their country. You've done so many things that is quite outstanding. How did you manage all this in such a short space of time? (laughs) Well, I must just look really young. So I'll take that as a compliment, but thanks for this. So uh, re- re- just a real quick point of clarification. They are international bestselling books, but I didn't get New York Times bestseller. I wish I had New York Times on the top of that list, but I didn't get New York Times, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, we sold thousands and thousands of copies of both those books when they came out. And really what it comes down to, Jabez, I, I am very driven and motivated to accomplish a lot of things. And joining the military when I was straight out of high school, you know, you learned a lot. Um, I learned not to get sucked into a lot of things that just, you know, we call them time vampires that suck your time and suck your life away. So I ended up spending a lot of my time just doing a lot of different things. And that's re- led me down one path after another, there after another. And as a result, I've just gotten very, very good with my time management. And yeah, I have consulted with a number of companies, Fortune 500 businesses, as well as a number of startups and investors, things like that. So. I really spend my time learning as much as I possibly can, listening to podcasts just like yours and getting a chance to, you know, expand my horizons. And then once I learn something I really like, I apply it. So that's really the the short answer to all of that. At Zelhan, we believe in the power of the internet, software, 
and technology to make it easier to start and run a successful business online. Go to zellhand.com and set up a pay discovery session with our team. Tell us the problems holding your business back from increasing revenues, getting more clients and being successful. Our team will help you develop a strategy or solution to increase your revenues, profits, or solve any business problem that you might have. Tell us your problems and we will take care of everything else for you. Our pay discovery session fee will be removed from your project fee if you work with us within a month of your first discovery session. This allows us to do our best work with clients who are serious about working with us. Go to zellhand.com forward slash consultation or click the link in the description of this video to book your first session. Now let's get back to the video. Sounds perfect because straight out of high school into the Navy, how did you, after joining the Navy from high school, get to become a nuclear power plant manager? Like, how did that happen? Because doesn't that need special <laughs> training or was well, it reading? There's a lot of training. There's no doubt about it. There's, there's mm -hmm. a lot of training. Okay, so really funny story. So when I was... When I was younger growing up, all I wanted to do was play baseball for the Dodgers. That was my life goal all the way up and through into high school. That's all I wanted to do. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I, I was I was pretty good at it. We went on an international team and I played in Australia at the time we lived in Colorado. And unfortunately, I didn't know enough about my own physiology and my own body. And I ended up hurting my shoulder and ended up having to have surgery on my shoulder uh, when I was 16 years old. So that ruined any chance of me being able to be a pitcher for the Dodgers, unfortunately. And wow. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just knew I didn't want to go into debt. I didn't really want to go to college. I didn't have any desire to go to college. And a guy comes in in a uniform when I'm a junior in high school and offers to buy me pizza for lunch one day and tells me, yeah, you could join this. You could. And we take this, this test called the ASVAB. Um, it's a vocational aptitude. They call it the vocational aptitude battery. It's a test to determine how good you are with uh, you know, vocational skills. And I was a mechanic. I worked in an auto shop. My dad was a mechanic, ran a hardwood floor shop. My grandpa was a mechanic and all that. So I, I, I had a mechanical gene. I know how to fix things. And he brings me in. He looks at my scores and he says, well, you'd be great in our program here. And um, you know, also, you know, if you go international and you go on and you become a sailor, then you know you get all the girls you want when you go around the world, right? <laughs> I thought that was, as a, as a 17 year old at the time, that's all I needed to hear, right? How was marketing? Um, yeah, it was great marketing. Really, it was. You know, he hit right on the hot buttons. I was in a small town in Colorado, and he said, "Go see the world. Go have fun. We'll pay you to do it." No, oh, by the way, the women will love you. And uh, you know, little did did I know at the time that you still had to know how to communicate effectively with people to to make that work out. But you know, that was the sales pitch. And I took a few more tests. They put me into the nuclear power program. And when I joined the military, I didn't know anything about nuclear power. I had no idea how it worked. I thought it was some sort of like nuclear electromagnetism thing. And I had all these ideas. And then I got in and I learned that it's a really, really big water heater, a very, very powerful water heater is essentially what it is. Um, but it runs on nuclear power. And so over the next six, six years, um, I was only in for six years. I went all the way through the ranks. We did school. When you're going to school for nuclear power, you're going to school 80, 100 hours a week. And you're not allowed to leave the classroom with any materials because everything's confidential. So you literally live, it's, it feels like you're living in the classroom, right? You're there early in the morning until late at night. You're working out all the time and you're not allowed to really go where, anywhere and do anything. And you're under drinking age, so you can't go out and get drunk. Um, so there's a lot of things you can't do. And so as a result, you just pour yourself into your work. And then when you're on a submarine, um, I, I became a scuba diver eventually. But when you're on a submarine, you don't have anywhere to go. You know, it's not like you're, in, you don't have, you know, you, back then especially, you didn't have access to the internet. You didn't have access to things like YouTube or Google or anything like that. So you brought books and you studied. You learned as much as you could. You did your job, but you read a whole lot. And that's how I spent a lot of my time. So, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a lot of grueling hours in the military because even though you go, you go through three different schools, even once you get out to the boat, then you have to do what's quali called qualification. You learn everything over and over again that's specific to your job and then specific to the systems and specific to the boat. So there's a lot of training that goes into it. I heard so many important things. Um, just right off the bat, playing for the Dodgers, wanted to be a pitcher. That was the dream. Shoulder injury derails all of that. Very similar story to James Clear, where he also wanted to be a baseball player. 
he had a major accident. I think he got slugged in the face with a baseball bat. And that dream was over. One of our guests on the podcast as well, uh, Coach Faith, a positive psychologist, had a similar situation with her wrestling career and she made it to the state level. So I'm seeing a pattern here where those who are resilient and they've decided that it's going to be success in one form or the other, they've made it through. I asked the question about the Navy, the submarines, because I wanted to learn what were the lessons here that you learned that set you on a path to entrepreneurial success. And I've heard a few things. I've heard that, hey, grueling hours, you can't go anywhere. I mean, you came in for the girls, but before you could get the girls, you had to get your stars, you had to get your badges, and you had to be qualified to get out there to get the girls, right? And as an entrepreneur, and I'm sure we have many entrepreneurs watching and listening right now, there is no greater reality to an entrepreneur than that. You have to go through hours and hours and hours and reps and reps for years even before a smidge of success comes through. And then they say, well, it's an overnight success. I want to put it to you right now. In your Navy days, getting up, getting in the classroom, 100 hour study weeks, reading books, application, some of the lessons that you've learned. And I want to mention Robert Kiyosaki in his book, uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. He joined the Navy as a pilot. And I'm not sure you've met Robert, correct? Yeah. Yeah, I know Robert. Um, yeah, he was a Marine back in the Vietnam era. So uh, Robert and I share, he's, he's actually, in 2003, mm -hmm. um, I was on deployment. And actually, it was 2002. I was on deployment. I read that book. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad for the first time. <laughs> and so at that point, the book was only about five years old and I had read it and it changed my life, right? So it was at that point that I began my entrepreneurial journey, but I wasn't an entrepreneur yet, right? I just had these great ideas. And the funny thing about life in general is that, you know, we can read as much as we want. We can read the words, we can go to school, we can ingest the knowledge, we can think we really understand it. And I've done that a lot. I've, I've read more than I think most people do. But the fact is just because you learn something doesn't mean that you're gonna be good at it or you're gonna be able to apply it properly. That was sure. something I learned in the military. Um, we had this course called Reactor Principles and I'll never forget it because it was the most laborious, difficult thing I'd ever gone through in my entire life because I felt like I was reading Greek. You know, I didn't understand what we were talking about. Lattice structures and the way metals are formed and the way metals work and attenuating atoms and all these things. And none of it made any sense to me, but you have to pass the class. And so I did like every good student. I crammed my brain full of information that I would just memorize for long enough, regurgitate it on a test and then dump it out. Mm -hmm. Right. Thinking, what do I need to know all that stuff for? It's not important. Well, years later, when I'm actually out there and we're we're underway, and we're operating the equipment. And we're seeing things happening that shouldn't necessarily be happening. This is when all of a sudden that theory came into practice. Like, okay, let's apply this information and what we know to be happening and know to be true based off the science. Now we're putting it into application. Now, all of a sudden, I was essentially relearning the information in real time while I'm doing the job. And it was a lot easier for me to grasp it, right? It was really easy for me to now take this theoretical stuff that I learned from a book years earlier and apply it in my actual job. And it's the same thing with when I was reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad. It all yes. made a lot of sense. Yeah, you should go work for yourself. You know, pay yourself first. You should get out of the employee quadrant, get into self-employed, but eventually get over the business owner quadrant and the investor quadrant. All makes a lot of sense, right? But in the real world application of it, it is not easy to do, right? Um, and, and anybody who acts like it's easy to do is is fooling everyone right <laughs> or they're just a charlatan and they're they're lying to everyone sure um so yeah I, I read that book in 2002 and that set me on that path and the discipline that the navy gave me is what i needed to stick through to it okay so that that's kind of how that whole process um worked out for me yeah and um the thing that is interesting is that gary vaynerchuk shares your sentiments he says that it's all good and dandy when you read the book and you learn about this and learn about that. But until you mm -hmm. get out, you get your hands dirty and get punched in the face a few times, you really don't yep. know anything. Exactly. Yeah. Tell? Well, it, it's 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 so true, right? You know, I was when I worked in a in a job after I got out of the navy, I went into risk management for a while because I didn't have any money and I didn't know what I wanted to do and I didn't know what kind of 
business I wanted to start, and this was in 2006. Um, at that time, I was living in the Bay Area with uh, my, my girlfriend at the time, and I needed to go into this, this job, and I, I couldn't stand the management structure in the job. I like the job because I work from home. I, I, I've been working from home since 2006. I haven't had to have a go to an office or anything like that. And, you know, the management structure kind of drove me nuts because I felt like the people that I, that worked, that I worked for knew less about the job and about what I was doing than I did. And that really annoyed me. Here I am, 24 years old, and I'm getting very annoyed because I know more about the thing that I'm doing than the people who are supposed to be in charge. And so they, you know, saw this and they promoted me and eventually I became a manager. And what I learned along that journey was, and I had gone through a number of leadership courses and management courses. I got my MBA along the way. And all of it is, you know, again, it's great in theory, but until you actually have to manage people and you have to deal with real world situations and real life happening and customer complaints and all of this stuff, doesn't matter how much you know, until because once you start dealing with people, you're dealing with a whole new dynamic, and that is everything can change. Everything's a variable at that point, and so it's it's through real world practical application that we actually get become successful. It's not through just reading and, and studying things. I love your story because it's practical, and I'm just going to put it out there. It sounds like you never were the rich kid with the spoon in his mouth that oh gosh, no. you never had to get out there. <laughs> what was your drive from such a young age? Because baseball players don't earn peanuts, all right? And there are only so many baseball players in the world that plays in the, in the MLB, correct? Mm -hmm. And right. I'm from Jamaica. Baseball is not so big here. Cricket, and we're not so good at it, but I digress. <laughs> and that would tell you that you would have needed to be super competitive super committed just to even think that you're going to make it to play for the dodgers which is an excellent team the last time i checked so where did you get this drive from and it served you so well really you know i, I can't say for sure where the drive comes from and i think that I, I think that some people can pinpoint exactly where it comes from it comes from some person in their life telling them they can do all these things and for me, it was just always nothing was ever good enough and I never had enough, right? That mm -hmm. was really the main drive. And I think a lot of that comes from my childhood. You're right. I was definitely not born with a spoon in my mouth. My dad was self-employed and had his own uh, business and he worked his butt off. And my mom uh, had job after job after job. And we didn't have a lot of money. And at one point, we actually got kicked out of our house and we were homeless for a, a short period of time and relying on the goodwill of friends and and others and uh, we didn't have a place to live for a while and i'll never forget that and i think that you know when, it, when people ask me that question and i go back to and i try and figure okay what would be this thing that really pushes me on the path because i could be really comfortable with a six-figure salary and working for somebody else but i'm not and i've, I've had that I've, I've left the six-figure corporate world because i couldn't stand it. um and i'd say that the the main thing for that that drive is having to watch your family go through really really hard times and also realizing that all this hard work is not paying off, right? So if hard work is not really getting you all the results you want, and then working for other people is not getting you all the results you want, then there's got to be something else that maybe we should be doing. And again, that's where sort of uh, Robert Kiyosaki's philosophy made it all make sense for me, right? And I'd say that as a parent now, myself, husband and a father, I never want my kids to have to go through that. So of course I'm going to continue pushing so that they don't have to see that, but I never want to go through it again either. All right? Let's not forget there is some there is a certain amount of egotism that goes into being an entrepreneur, and oh, yeah. anyone who wants to deny that is full of themselves, right? <laughs> you know they they want What's to say the they're doing it 100 percent for everybody else, but the fact is, you know, Dude. everybody else will be okay at some point in their life, even if you're not around. So there is a certain amount of egotism that goes into it, and we have to acknowledge that, right? Are you familiar with Patrick Bet David from Valuetainment? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Patrick says that um, tough times create strong people. Strong people mm -hmm. create good times. And good times create weak people. And the weak people then create tough times. So it's like a circle. It I is, heard yeah. you mention tough times. I myself has had a I've had a similar story. Not in the sense of being put out because I had grandma and I had grandpa, but 
I'm beginning to think that whenever you grow up, and this is just a speculation, you can tell me what you think. Just growing up and seeing your parents faced with a certain reality and the love that you had for them kind of put you in a position where you're like, something is missing. Mom and dad are working really hard and they're good people, but they don't have the money such and such a person has. Something is missing. They must be doing something wrong. And then when you read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, it was like, all right, well, this is what they're doing wrong. You know, they don't have the fully, they don't have a full understanding of exactly how true finances work. If they could correct this one thing or this one thing, then it would work. And that gave you not only the inspiration, but it's, it gave you the roadmap. So many people get up and they read motivational quotes. I am the best. I can do it. That doesn't do mm-hmm. anything. We don't need motivation. We just need a plan. We need a, a, a step-by-step action to get there. And we do that. That's what entrepreneurship is. So for you, do you think this is something that kind of set you up for where you are today? I think that that has a lot to do with it, right? You know, if, mm-hmm. if you, and, and I hate to say it, but my kids are spoiled rotten now. And I try not to spoil them. Re- yesterday I had them you know, using a saw and cutting uh, branches off a tree because they actually need to learn how things work and how to actually do things themselves. But right. and my one child, uh, my younger boy, Brody, he jumps right into most things, not everything, but most things with both mm-hmm. feet and really excited to do something and try it out. My older son needs a little bit more coercing, right? He's like, oh, geez, this actual work. I don't want to do that. I'm like, oh, t- too bad. You got to learn how to do that. Um, and I think that you're actually right. Tough times do, it, it breeds a tough mentality. Right. And it helps you get that thick skin because the world is not easy. The world is cruel. The world is um, it's going to put you in your place over and over again. And it's going to teach you humility. Right. In ways unimaginable, because you don't necessarily know where that's going to come from or what it's going to manifest as. And so I'd say that I had a few things going for me. Um, you know, my, my wife would say that my Pisces comes in as well, because, you know, I just don't really care a lot about what other people think of me, which has done me really well over the years. I have become very immune to criticism over the years. I think that's a really important skill for every entrepreneur to, to learn. Um, but yeah, going through the tough times absolutely get, helped me uh, build that tough skin and that thick skin to, to make sure that I could weather the storm. Robert Kiyosaki kind of gave me the idea. And, you know, if you put this idea together with my parents, so my dad was a self-employed business owner and he did at one point have a, a thriving business with 50 employees and doing really well, but then things didn't work out. And then it comes right back to, okay, well, how do you go from that you know, self-employed quadrant to the business owner quadrant? That's a really big leap. Like that's a huge leap for a lot of people to make. Um, and so that requires a whole new skill set and a whole new outlook on life. And so going back to your initial question about my motivation, the driving force, the driving factor, it's for me, you're never going to be done learning, right? You have to continue learning. And you know, we can't learn just by reading everything. There's a lot of great things you can read and learn about, and that's wonderful. But for example, making that shift from self-employed to business owner where other people are running the business, that's a mindset shift. That's a leadership shift. That is um, an understanding of economics and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So there's just so many different things that they come into that. And so you start finding different teachers. You have to find a new mentor, a new advisor, somebody else to look up to, another mastermind to go to, someplace to further your education. Because, you know, I, I, I love and hate this, this saying because I understand where it comes from. But um, people have this vaccination theory of education, which is, oh, I got the shot in my arm. I got the degree. I got the diploma. I got the whatever. And they're done. Right. And the real world is one of the best educations you can get. So it's, you know, the school of hard knocks. Um but at some point, everybody's going to be dealt a blow that makes them feel like they just get knocked down completely. And yeah. that's, it's really a humbling experience when that happens. I think it happens to everybody who's successful. Uh, Brian Tracy talked about an in, uh, a study they did a long time ago. And out of all these multimillionaires and billionaires they'd interviewed, they asked them how many times they'd all failed. And the average number of times that these people had failed in business, not just like little failures, things didn't work out very well or whatever, like actual businesses shut down, business completely failed, fell apart, was 11 times, right? So they lost their businesses upwards of 11 times on average. I mean, some people maybe lost 20 times before they actually really became successful. 
And that was a light bulb moment for me, right? Realizing that, okay, you don't have to get it right the first time out of the gate. And anybody who tells me they get it right the first time out of the gate, I generally disregard because it's either luck or they had a lot of help from other people. And if they're not acknowledging that, then that's an issue for me. And it sounds like the investor in you is speaking right now into the types of people and businesses that, well, when you invest in businesses, contrary to those young guys out there, we're not really investing in the business. We're investing in the person who runs the business. So are these like traits that you look for in entrepreneurs and business owners whenever you're going to invest or you're going to consult with a team, for example? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, there's a, you, we have a phrase, we, we bet on the jockey, not just the horse, right? Um, the technology can be great, but we've seen great technology after great technology fail. We've even True. seen businesses that have raised a lot of money fail, fail really fast, actually. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that sometimes the, the founder is naive, which mm -hmm. let's be honest, most entrepreneurs, when we think about how great our business is going to be, we're all heads in the clouds, right? Yep. Um, but the, the real the reality is, is that there's a certain level of just head in the clouds versus, okay, let's, let's have a, a reality check here and let's make sure that we have actual benchmarks, deliverables, KPIs, goals that we're going to achieve, milestones we're going to go after. Do we have a team behind us that's going to help us out? Do we have all the people that we need? And are we good at managing all of that? And a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, they're not good managers. They're actually terrible managers. And it's because they're very visionary. They want to focus on what's next. Um, I just had a conversation with my team this morning. They said, yeah, the CEO, me, their CEO, me, it always has all these different ideas and we're trying to implement them all at once. I said, guess what? That's the nature of being a CEO, right? It's your job to come up with what's next. It's your job to be the visionary. And, and so most people company. are not that. And that's also makes it really, really hard to manage people. If you're constantly thinking about what's next and what's next on the roadmap, it makes it very difficult to manage people. So going back to investing in businesses, it's the team, right? It's not even the individual. If somebody is not good at building a team around them and getting this team to show up and do the work, then the business itself is not gonna uh, uh, prosper. On the other hand, you can, you'll can you see a lot of businesses, it's like it's a mediocre idea at best, but the business flourishes because they've built a great team around them and they actually have a great culture. Gillette. <laughs> yeah. They've yeah. made so much money selling razors and that's the business model, sell razors. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that one shift literally changed the game, not only for that business, but for the industry, the industry. right? I mean, we, we've seen so many different things change as a result of that, putting continuity programs in place and things of that nature. But yeah, having, having the right people around you, because you can't come up with all the ideas yourself. And yes. even if you could, it doesn't mean they're good. <laughs> True. You're familiar because you're a reader, so I think you'll know this book. Are you familiar with Start With Why by Simon Sinek? Yeah, of course. And you recall the story of how the, Will, the Wright brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright, they beat a government-funded team of scientists and engineers to create in the well, I would say create is like inventing or building the first mm -hmm. airplane. That right there, in a nutshell, is the crux of the matter. I know something I want to highlight as well. There's a book, um, Stephen Covey. It's right here, actually. Stephen mm -hmm. Covey. The Seven Habits? No, and the other one is The Four Disciplines of Execution. It's right there. Right. You can grab it if you want. And in that book, it speaks about why whenever you try to implement a winning strategy in your business, most times it fails. And you'd be surprised that the reason why it fails most times is because people aren't clear on what it is that they're supposed to do. They also aren't clear on why they're doing it. And because they have their other job to do, they feel like if they focus on this new shiny object, then they're going to lose focus and they're not going to get the actual work done. And yep. the reason why I bring this up is because communication is so important. If the entrepreneur, the CEO in this situation, his job is not necessarily just to be the best person for the job in terms of the analytics and the strategy, but inspiring and motivating and leading the team, then how big of a deal is communication? I mean, communication is vital. You, you can't you can't grow any business without proper communication, proper leadership. And there's so much to unpack in just that one idea, right? Of yeah. coming up with a new new idea and then communicating it to the team and then getting the team to take it on board. 
So I'll give you a, an example. Um, when I worked at this company, Hartford Steam Boiler, we had over, I think we traveled over 4 million miles or maybe it was 1 million miles per year. I can't remember the exact number. I think it was 4 million miles a year that our, um, our staff would drive to go visit locations every single year. We had 5 million locations that we insured and we looked at. And our job was to get all of our people to where they needed to be on time, right? So you think about UPS or Amazon or any of these companies trying to get all the people where they go on time. And that's a lot of, a lot of logistics. Yep. And we look at it from the outside and go, yeah, of course. I mean, I placed the order. Of course, they should have the, the product in the truck and the truck should arrive at the time they say it's going to arrive and so on. That technology to build that is not easy. Right? That, that was actually a massive undertaking by a lot of people to make that happen. But on yes. the on the consumer end, we think no big deal. Well, inside the business, that's also a cultural shift. If you're going from pen and paper with a, a, a route slip in the morning to all of a sudden using a tablet or a computer or not even having a tablet or a computer, but the GPS just being auto updated with where you're going, that's mm -hmm. a cultural shift, right? Yes. So not only do you have to communicate why you're doing it, but you also have to help them understand how to do it and what is the ramification of not doing it and then make sure they're very clear on what it is they're doing on a specific because most people are not entrepreneurs this is a really big lesson that i learned the hard way in life i thought everybody would want to be an entrepreneur when they realized that's the only way you can really gain that true freedom in life is by building something of your own selling it and making money right i thought everybody would want to be an entrepreneur it turns out most people don't most sure. people want to clock in they want to do the thing that's on their punch list that day, and then they want to go home and they want to be done with it. Yes. And so as a result, if you implement or introduce a new technology or even a new product or a new process, even maybe it's the exact same product, the same technology, but let's change the way we do things a little bit. And we expect a, a, a new result or a better result at the end. If you don't train people, if you don't communicate why you're doing it, why it's so profound, why it's so important in an effective way and then train them and then make sure they understand it and then not only make sure they understand it and they know why they're doing it, but then they can implement it and then they can show you the results of that and teach it back to somebody else. If you don't have that kind of process dialed and you'll never scale a business, you'll never be successful. And that's exactly what Stephen Covey talks about, which is, you know, you always start with the end in mind, right? That's one of his principles. You always start with the end in mind. And Simon's and I start with why, why are we doing this? What's the goal, right? That's kind of what those two paradigms talk about. And then how do we get there? And the how do we get there is the communication, it's leadership, it's vision, it's it's management, it's training, it's SOPs, it's all the different things inside of that. The how we get there is is really the critical piece. And I think that's a, a real challenge for a lot of entrepreneurs. It's a really big challenge for any company that wants to go from that self-employed to that business owner. And it's a bigger challenge even still when you try and shift a culture around um, and you try and change you know, who is in charge or how you want to do things. So those are really, really important pieces of growing a business. Yeah, absolutely. And um, in Rich Dad Poor Dad, Robert Kiyosaki speaks about the four quadrants, you know, the employee, the self-employed business owner, the investor and so on. And he said that one of the biggest things that we have to realize is that whenever you look at the quadrant, each person from each quadrant speaks a different language. Everyone speaks a different language. To so the employee, they want to be able to clock in and know that at the end of two weeks or a month, they're going to get a paycheck. And that's very different from the investor who wants to know that they put their money here and they're going to get back such and such a return in such and such a time. And this is how long it's going to take for them to make that money that they invest and everything like that. The reason why I'm bringing up all of this is because I want to look at the other side of your career. When you started your business and I know that you've had some wins and because you've had wins it means you've had a whole lot of failures what are some of the moments of reckoning that really taught you the most important lessons that you've had in your career to date you know I would say you know, the the biggest lesson that I've learned I'm still learning it to be quite honest um you know I have always been really really good with technology I've been really good with systems and structure I've been good with building systems one of the biggest challenges that I would say I've had is actually becoming the expert and I think a lot of people when they hear that that might confuse them a little bit like you want the leader to be the expert you want them to know you know be the most you know, maybe sometimes the smartest person in the room um, but I have been the expert in a lot of things. And 
as a result of being the expert, we actually had an acronym. We used the Navy as an acronym, N-A-V-Y, never again volunteer yourself. And the reason we'd say that is because if you all of a sudden got to be the best person at doing a thing, if you didn't train your replacement, then you would never get out of doing that thing. And so my biggest learning lesson point, I'd say, in growing and scaling businesses, you know, I've started several companies from scratch. I've built several six-figure, seven-figure, and even eight-figure businesses. And I've worked inside of multi-billion dollar corporations as well. Um, and consulted for them. And so the biggest challenge that I have had along this entire journey is that I'm the one that has all the information. And if you're the CEO, if you're the founder, if you're the business owner, and you're the only one that has the information or the know-how to do something, you will never be able to grow your business. And so a part of my you know, growth and learning was how do I extract this information out of my head to teach it to somebody else, maybe they'll never be as good as I am. In, in, in some areas, they never will be. But more importantly, maybe I'll find somebody who is better at this thing than I am. But they're only going to be good at this one thing, right? And so there's that saying, which is, you know, master of all trades, jack of none. But it can, goes on to say, but still always better than a master of one, right? And what that means is that it's really great if you are the best person, you know, let's just say you're a guy who's a framer on houses and you are the best one at putting together the frame for a house and you can hammer that nail and you can put that house together. That's great. You can frame a house. No problem. No one ever questions your quality, your work ethic, anything. That's wonderful. The problem with that is if he's the best person at that he's not seeing the whole picture, right? He only sees the frame of the house. He's not seeing the electrical, the plumbing, the roof, the insulation, the flooring, the design. He's not seeing all of that, right? And one of the lessons that I had to learn was that I had to stop being that carpenter. I had to stop being that expert at the one thing. I had to be the expert at the big picture. And I had to be able to what we call architect the business. So yeah, I'm the systems guy. I'm the technology guy. And I'm going to teach my team how to get it there. But then I need to find, like Stephen Covey says, the right people on the bus. I'm, or as a Jim Collins. It might have been Jim Collins on that one good to great but i need to find the right people for the right seat on the bus who can take this from where i drop it off as being a semi-expert in a certain area and they need to take it on from there so i would say that would be the biggest lesson if i could if i could go back to my 20 year old self <clears throat> and i would could mentor myself along the way and speed up everything that i've done i would say stop being the expert start learning the big picture and then learn how to find the right people to fill those seats on the bus. That would be the number one uh, lesson that I would love to have learned earlier. That sounds like the transition from the small business owner or self-employed to the actual business owner and the investor, where you realize that for this thing to work, I can't be doing everything. I need therefore a competent man with the right mindset that can be trained, that will be able to do it to a certain proficiency level. And you know the interesting thing about all of this? Patrick B. David said it as well. The less your business depends on you to work, the more valuable it becomes. And yep. as a small business owner, it sounds counterintuitive, right? Because we have this ego, it's the ego all over again, you know. We've spent 10 years in sales, we've done such and such numbers that it's outstanding. We've won awards. How can we then leave sales to somebody else and focus on growing the business to 10 figures or something like that? It's, it's inconceivable. Let me stay in sales and then I'll, try, I'll figure out the rest. It doesn't work. The businesses that you've consulted with, large corporations, started your own businesses doing six, seven, eight figures, two or three lessons, the things that they've done right, that once they get these two or three things right, they tend to work out well. What are those three, two or three things? Yes. Funny, I was actually talking with one of my business partners recently about this. Um, mm -hmm. Most businesses that get started, right? If you are starting up, even if you're a small business owner, you're saying, okay, like my ex-wife was a chiropractor. She didn't go to school to learn how to run a chiropractic office. She learned how to, you know, manipulate people's spines and she became a chiropractor. She didn't know how to run a business. That was my job. And most people are, are folks like her that say, 
well, I'm the expert at this thing. Obviously, I should be the business owner, the CEO. But those are two completely different skill sets. And so if you want to scale up any company, you have to first realize that e-myth, that idea that the technician should be in charge of the business or be doing it is, is really a challenge, right? And so everybody wants to focus in on the operations, right? So the chiropractor learns how to be a chiropractor. That's operations, that's service delivery. The auto mechanic learns how to be a mechanic. That's the operations, that's service delivery. So everybody learns that piece first, okay? And that is a major, major challenge to scaling anything because now you might have the best mousetrap. You might be the best carpenter, like I was saying. You might be the best mechanic, the best doctor, whatever. But there's still another piece of that, right? There's the marketing and the sales. If people don't know you exist, which is marketing, you got to make sure people know about you and then there's they have a reason to come to you. And then there's sales, which is getting the money out of their bank account and into your bank account. And then you can do that thing, right? So there's all these steps that have to happen before you can even show them how amazing you are. So everybody wants to talk about the operations and how you, you really refine and systemize the operations. That's important, no doubt about it. You can't scale a business if you don't Oper, uh, systemize the operations, right? And so what we have, what I call, this is called the AOL framework, right? So you are the the authority, you are the owner, you're the leader, right? And you're, I'm sorry, you're the architect, the owner, and the leader, right? And as the architect, you have to build the systems, right? So the architect who designs the house, they're not putting the nails in the boards and putting the roof on and putting the electrical in. But at the end of it, you have this amazing house that wouldn't have existed if the architect didn't put the blueprints together, right? So you have to be the architect. And that means you have to architect not just a piece, but the whole thing. And this is where businesses that scale versus those that stagnate get it very right, right? A business that stagnates might be really good at operations. And let's just say they're, you know, the, using the, con the carpenter example, they're the best house framers ever. That's great. But... That, only, that means that they still have a ceiling. They're stuck at a certain level because they might have the best operational system there is, but if they don't focus on marketing and sales, they're not going to get more people coming, right? Sure. Versus a company that's great at marketing, but is terrible at operations because they haven't systemized that. They somehow managed to do the online digital uh, marketing. They get leads coming in every single day. They can do all that just fine. Well, if they can't provide a really great service on the back end, then no one's going to stick around or they're going to get refunds and chargebacks. We don't want that either. So you have to get your marketing, your sales, and your operations all completely aligned. And I would say that that's where you find the companies that really scale is when they figure out how to align the message that they send out in the marketing to the sales presentations and the closing that they're doing to all of a sudden a seamless streamlined delivery of the operations and the service delivery on the back end. That's how you scale a company. And so what you need to become is that architect, that owner, and that leader inside of your business. Sounds good. And that's what the business is, because then now you have a framework that you can multiply. I like the example again from Richard Poor that I seem to be talking about that book a lot today, where Robert says that a lot of people can make burgers better than Burger King, but only one person is making a billion dollar sales per year, right? It's the systems that matter as well. Mm -hmm. I know that you've done a lot in your entrepreneurial career to date. I know that you've achieved so much. and. I aspire to be a lot more like you in terms of success and so on. I also know that there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that someone would be looking from the outside in and they, they're doe-eyed and they're in awe and they're inspired and they don't realize what it actually takes. Before we get there, you wrote two books, international bestsellers, not New York Times bestsellers, but they've done pretty well. Could you just in a brief moment just share with us the reason why you wrote these two books and who exactly these books are for that way someone listening yeah. someone watching who wants to learn more from you can know exactly where to go right now yeah absolutely so i wrote the ultimate guide to self-directed investing and retirement planning back in 2012 when i was a financial advisor and i was helping people invest in real estate and start doing some private equity investing and the whole idea behind that was most people are relegated to putting their 401k and their IRA and the retirement plans into mutual funds that are not doing very well for them, right? So it was, how do you get financial freedom through proper investing, okay? That was what that, that book was all about. And then the other book, All Hands on Deck, was all about how to um, structure and systemize 
are how U.S. Navy, Submariner, Structure, Systemize, and Optimize for Success. And it was all about taking my military career and talking about how you can apply that in business, how you can actually build those systems inside your business based off of um, Submariner principles. And the whole idea behind writing these books was people are, you know, for lack of a better term, doing it wrong, right? You know, if you want to be successful, if you want to have freedom and autonomy in your life, then you can't rely on the powers that be. You can't rely on the system. You can't rely on you know, your, your job or your boss. You can't rely on having that job forever. You definitely don't have a pension plan anymore. You can't rely on the markets taking care of you. You can't rely on anybody else. And so in order to have personal autonomy and freedom, which is what I strive for in my life, you first have to have an education. You need to know what is available and what's possible and what's preventing you from achieving what you want. That's step one. The second step is taking that personal responsibility to move in that direction, right? And that's why I wrote those books. The whole idea was in business, there's a way to be free from doing all the mundane things. Like right now, I have a team around the world that's doing a lot of work for me so that I don't have to do it, which is great. And as a result, we can scale the business because I'm not the one responsible for everything. In the financial side of things, you have to have access to other financial products. That's why we have Angel Investors Network. That's why we do events. That's why we do all this stuff, because we want people to have access to things they've never heard about that, you know, for example, one of my clients just got off the phone uh, right before this. We were talking about their hedge fund, which is available to you know accredited investors, but it's hedge funds in New York City on Wall Street have a hundred million dollar minimum investment. Most people are not going to be able to write that hundred million dollar check, right? And if sure. they are, they're probably already in the hedge fund business. Yep. So we talk about bringing opportunities like that to people. So it starts with education, and then we we bring it full circle with our products and our services. Sounds good. I love all hands on that idea here is that I think it will give me the framework that I need to get to that next level. As we're all students right here, I'll continue learning. And then I'll get to, can you repeat the name of the book on pensions, please? I, I, I slipped my mind. Yeah, the first one was The Ultimate Guide to Self-Directed Investing and Retirement Planning. I will read that book second. Because what I'm looking at here is that once you read All Hands on Deck, it gives you the income necessary to start investing. And that's kind of the best way to go about things. You have, since 2015, raised over a billion dollars in investment for your clients. And you've also, since 2015, done a whole lot in sales. A whole lot. And by whole lot, I mean like hundreds of millions of dollars. There's a young investor there's a young business owner, there's an entrepreneur with an idea, and they don't want to use their own money. They're thinking of getting investment. What is your advice to this person? Do they jump head first into getting investment? Do they perhaps try to get a minimum viable product where they get a sample out and say, all right, we definitely have something working. This is what we're making at this price for this person because we have this data here. Or do they try to bootstrap and say, all right, because the MVP works, the minimum viable product works, let's slowly grow. What do you say to people thinking about seeking investment for their business at this time? Yeah, so to answer that, I'll give you a scenario um, because a lot of people ask us the same question, right? Mm -hmm. And somebody comes to you and they say, hey, Javez, I want to you know, start this business and I really need you know, $100,000 to get it going, right? And the investor, you in this case, is sitting there and you're looking at the business. You might like the idea, you might like the product, you might like the person, you might like the company, you might like everything they've said. And then if you were to ask one question, and that one question could really gauge how serious this person is about growing the business, because that's really what you need. You need somebody with the utmost integrity and perseverance. Right? That's what helps a company grow. The, the idea is necessary, of course, all those other things are important, but if you do not have the right kind of um, mental attitude right, going in and the right kind of persistence, you'll never grow, right? Mm -hmm. So the question that we train a lot of people to ask as an investor is, yeah, okay, this all sounds great, but do me a favor and tell me, what are you investing in this business, okay. right? And if people can't give a good answer to that, yes. then... It really tells you how serious they are about it. 
And that's you know the, the, the person who says, well, I haven't put anything in yet. I haven't even started. I haven't done anything yet because I'm waiting for money. Well, that's the biggest red flag there is, right? Yeah. And uh, the, the fact is that we need, even if you're broke, right? And you don't have a dime to your name and you don't even know anyone, which in this day and age is impossible not to know anyone with money. I mean, you can go on Twitter and you can start following people with money and you can direct message them, right? Like there's so many ways to get at the people with the money. There's more money. Uh, the governments just keep printing money. There's never going to be an end to this money the way they keep going. So I wouldn't worry too much about there not being enough money. Instead, what we need to do is we need to be resourceful. You may not have the resources right now, but you need to be resourceful. And if you can't answer that question as the entrepreneur that says, I am putting my life's work into this. I am dedicating every spare minute of the day. And I'm, you know, the next question that an investor is going to ask, if they're really intrigued, and if you've said, okay, I'm putting every spare minute, I have a job right now, I'm working my butt off, I'm, I'm spending every night, weekend and everything like that, going into this business, I'm eating top ramen and rice just to stay alive. You know, that shows you this person's hunk, right? I mean, literally and figuratively at this point. But the fact is that you now see this person's actually interested in growing their business. So the next question you ask is, okay, well, how are you taking care of yourself and your family and all those types of things? As an investor, you do want to know this stuff because, you know, we, we sometimes ask the, the question, well, how are you being fed? Right. And that's a, a meaning. How are you actually paying for the food on your plate right now? Because this next question is, OK, well, if you're working 40, 60, 80 hours a week just to make ends meet and you're still trying to put energy into this, I mean, that's admirable. But will it really take off? Okay, And this is where the investors now have to decide, should I put the, enough money into where you can quit that job and dedicate 100 percent of your time for this? Because if you're not dedicating 100% of your time for the thing I'm putting my money into, I don't want a part of it, right? Sure. That's a really important thing for people to understand. But it doesn't mean that the investor is gonna be naive and say, yeah, let me just give you the money even though you've never put any time or energy into it yet, right? I need to know that you're committed before I give you money. And I need to know that when I give you this money, you're gonna stay committed, right? So those are the that's kind of the way you wanna think about that when you're trying to raise money. I love the answer that you gave. One of the questions that I would have asked as well is, so they wanted $100,000, I would have asked, well, why don't you want $200,000 instead of $100,000? And why can't you make $100,000 to make this work? And you know, that gives you an idea of just how committed they are into finding ways to make it work. The reason is, you know, a lot of times people overrate investor money. If you're an entrepreneur and you don't know how to make money, then that's the thing you need to figure out more than anything else because more money is not the answer. I just want to share my story with you just quickly. I'm not the one being interviewed, but I think it will help us to have a better understanding of each other. I started my business in 2018 and it took a while to get things going. And I got to a point where there's this person, Charles Bukowski. I don't know if you're familiar with him. Well, Charles Bukowski is, uh, is an author and he has this famous quote where he says that he's in a post office and he wants to be successful as a writer. But he's at the post office because he wants to make ends meet. An author, a book publisher, sorry, reaches out to him, has an interest in his work, and says, I'll pay you to write. So the author says, the publisher says to him, I want to invest in your work, but I can't pay you for your work. And he says, Charles Bukowski, that he has two options at this stage. And he's writing back to the publisher. He says that he can either play at author and starve, or you can continue in drudgery, in drudgery at the post office. He's decided to starve. When I reached that point where I said, you know what? I'm going to starve. I'm putting the money into the business and then everything else comes after. And in a month, things worked out. I actually got a client and things turned for the better. The reason why I mention is because I don't want us to sit here and talk about the wonderful things that have happened and the lessons with our people. Understanding that entrepreneurship is not for everyone. You're going to mm -hmm. have more stress or sleepless nights, you're probably going to have a strained relationship and you're going to go through more BS, let's put it that way, censored, than in one lifetime than most people go through in three. Because you're going to have suppliers, you're going to have employees, you're going to have investors, you're going to have your family. And each of these categories are just an opportunity for something to go wrong. And when something goes wrong, you need to keep your cool, you need to keep your eye on the prize and you need to keep going. 
I believe that you having a tough skin, you having neighbor training, I believe you've learned those lessons really young, really early that helped you on your path to success. I am asking you perhaps the most important question at this stage. And the reason I'm asking is because I want to look beyond what most people see. If you could do it all over again, from scratch, you are looking at yourself at 12 years old and you're saying, well, I'm not going to be going into baseball anymore. Or even, you know what, let's put it just after high school. Just before you join the Navy, you're looking at yourself and you say, you know what? I want to go into business. I want to own my own business. I want to invest in a few. I think I'll sell some. This is the life I want to live. What do you tell yourself at this stage that's going to keep you going through everything that you've been through? <laughs> um, at that stage, I would have told my, I would go back and tell myself to join the Navy. 100% still one of the best things I could have done. Um, I, when I joined, I thought I was going to be a lifer. I thought I was going to stay in for 30 years and that quickly soured in my mouth and I decided to get out. But the other thing I would have told myself at that stage is, you know, and, and this is also a really hard lesson that I've learned over my career is there's in business, nothing's easy, right? But let's put things on the spectrum. There's easier and there's damn near impossible, right? And the damn near impossible is the SpaceX's of the world, right? Trying to launch a brand new space company, right? That's, you know, in, in 1995, trying to launch an AI company, right? Those are the types of things that like, those are, we call them moonshots, of course, but those are the things that are really, really difficult to do. Take a lot of time and energy and all of that. And then there's the easy stuff, which is, you know, you're really good at this skill. Maybe go do this skill as a business and start growing that one. And I have to say what I did throughout my career was I always chose something a little bit closer to the harder end than the easier end when it came to business. And so what I would have told myself is join the Navy and spend every additional minute you have on trying to figure out what it is you want to do to make money if you could never work for anyone else a day in your life after you got out of the Navy. Because that paradigm shift can really change things. If you think that you're going to have a paycheck for an extended period of time, you're not going to put a lot of energy into doing something else. Yes. And even if you're doing it as a side hustle, Right. And that's what I did. I did side hustles. My side hustle was I want to try and build a really big business. I want to build a nine figure company or a company that I can sell off or make do an IPO. And when you're doing that, that's a lot of work. I mean, that's a ton of work. So just try and find a side hustle that's going to replace your current income for right now. Like just do that because there's so many businesses that somebody can go start and they can even get a little bit of funding for it without having to go down this world of trying to raise a whole bunch of capital and they can replace their current income. And I would say focus on, I would tell myself to try and figure that piece out rather than trying to figure out how to go really, really big the very first time out of the gate, right? Get the experience because, you know, everything from filing taxes and getting business permits and licenses and dealing with departments of revenue and um, you know, employees and all of that basic stuff is a real pain, but every business has to do it, at least in our country, right? And then from there, you learn some of the things and you're like, okay, let me just figure out how to farm this stuff out. Let me just figure out how to make money first. Then we'll think about how to go really big, right? But learn the basics of business first. That's what I'm saying. I like that idea. Because it's like telling yourself that, all right, you're going to run, but before you run, let me learn to crawl and then I'll walk. Maybe a bit of jogging, then I'll run. And yeah. the flexibility and the peace of mind that just having a side hustle replace your regular paycheck with will bring is going to allow you to focus more on the bigger picture, the damn impossible thing that you want to do. You know, they say that they say you can't um, focus on being a billionaire if you still can't feed yourself and your family. You know, learn to crawl before Yeah, I'll you agree run. with that. <laughs> I'll agree. I mean, it, it's hard to think past the end of the week if you're worried about making payroll or 
paying the rent or putting food on the, the table, right? Yeah. So take care of yourself, right? Take care of yourself first. And, you know, I'm in my 40s now. I would say that, and I, I tried starting a business while I had a mortgage and was married and had kids. And that's hard, right? Because now your baseline is so much higher. But does it mean it's not worth it? No, of course not. It just means that you have to try something a little bit different. Hopefully you're a little bit wiser, so hopefully it's somewhat easier. But being young and naive has its benefits as well, because you can be really broke and have almost zero um, you know, liabilities at that point and still be able to go after something. But yes. it doesn't mean that it's impossible either way. But yeah, definitely learn, learn the crawl, walk, run method. And that's true because it also allows you to take on more risks when you are less um, risk averse, no? When you're less likely to fail from risk. There is an air of education around you. You're an avid reader. What is the last best, well, what is the most recent good book that you've read that you think everyone should get their hands on to help them on their entrepreneurial journey? All right, give me two. So are you referring to a business book or just a book in general? Just a book in general. I, I read a lot about health and wellness. I read a lot about, um, I, I, I read some fiction as well. But if you're talking about a business book, um, I can re- recommend that one. Well, you tell me, which one do you want first? One business book and one other. Okay. So I would say the business book that everyone should read right now is from Alex Hormozzi. And it's called $100 Million Offers. Um, oh, yeah. You know, I've read... Yeah, the, the Irresistible Offer by Mark Joyner. I've read things from David um, Ogilvy and Gary Halbert and Dan Kennedy and all the, the old greats when it comes to marketing. And I will say that, you know, the, the fact is that when it comes to marketing and sales, if you don't have a great offer, especially if you're going online and especially in this day and age, then you're going to struggle, right? Um, you can't be a Me Too product. You can't be a Me Too service. And so I would say that um, reading that $100 million offers would be a great one. And he said another one would be the uh, the author you want me to mention? No, the other. A different, another author that we want people to go under? No, other. So it's not a business book. So it could be health, oh, it okay, could okay. be reality, lifestyle, mm. so on. Sure, sure. So I just got done um, reading Human Heart, Cosmic Heart. And I, I follow health and wellness. I've been on a health journey for over 20 years now. I have my own health conditions that we don't need to go too far into if we don't want to. But, um, you know, here I am in my forties and essentially I've had doctors tell me I shouldn't be here today. I I, I shouldn't have survived as long as I have uh, because of a heart condition that I have and a liver condition. that. But I have, and you know, I'm not willing to accept the the medical paradigm for what it is. And I'm definitely not willing to accept the big pharma um, mandates that they try and impose upon me to, to live because I've survived in spite of them. And reading that book, uh, Human Heart, Cosmic Heart, is one of the first ones where an author that's also a scientist and a medical doctor and a cardiologist has put how our hearts and our bodies actually work in such a way that it actually makes sense. Um, And again, if in order to read a book like that and, and take away really good things, you have to first understand that the paradigm that we grew up with and learning about physiology and biology is not exactly correct right true um and there's so much more that goes into that but i would say that that's a really good one either I, again I, I read a ton of stuff on health and wellness in general but that was one that i just finished reading it was a great book that sounds good it the book right here reminds me of barbara o'neill and dr walter white I'm a Seventh-day Adventist by a religious practice, and when we speak about health, it's a lot more than just going to the pharmacy and getting tablets. It's about the holistic part of life in terms of how are you mentally, spiritually, mm-hmm. physically. And Barbara O'Neill and Dr. Walter White, along with Ellen G. White, they speak a lot about how the food that we eat impacts our bodies. And you'd be surprised, I heard, that if you have a very healthy liver, you can't get cancer. And that that had me mind blown. So as entrepreneurs, we do love to work 15 hour work days because there's no other way to live. Take care of your health. I don't want to encroach on yep. your personal um, story in terms of your health battles and so on. Is that something you're uncomfortable about or? Well, we can talk about it. I, I have no problem talking about it. Um, mm-hmm. 
I have, I have uh, what's called familial hypercholesterolemia, right? And as a result of this, I've, I, I passed out when I was in the Navy and in boot camp. I'm 18 years old. I was in charge of the athletic program in our division. Um, I ended up passing out. I just fell down, you know, out cold. And they thought I just had heat exhaustion, which I probably did because we were in Chicago in the summertime and I wasn't used to that. So they took me in, they did blood, blood work on me, and they found out I had really, really high cholesterol, like obscenely high. And they thought they did the test wrong, so they did the test again and came back the same. And so ever since then, that was 23 years ago, um, I've had really, really high cholesterol. Well, they put me on medication after medication after medication. Every medication I got on gave me a side effect, something bad. Uh, as a result, it got to a point where it's like, I can't trust the medications anymore. I literally can't do it and I'm, I feel fine. So I'm not gonna take the medications. And I didn't do that for a number of years. And I had doctors telling me things like, oh, it's your diet. I went vegetarian for six months. I ate, you know, a salad three times a day. I was eating eggplant Parmesan. I wasn't doing noodles. I was, you know, I cut out grains and pastas and dairies and all that sort of stuff. And it didn't change my cholesterol at all. So um, what I realized was that the medical establishment didn't really know much about health in general, right? The allopathic world is great at fixing a problem when one arises, but they are terrible at preventing problems from happening in the first place. Right? Yes. You know, you get a migraine, they can tell you to take Excedrin. Great. You have a blood clot, they know how to do open heart oh, surgery. Yes. Wonderful. Glad we can keep people alive. But you know what they're terrible at is teaching people how to eat healthy. Um, most of my doctors are overweight. Most of these people couldn't do a push-up to save their lives. They they couldn't work out. They couldn't run a mile. And I've had people that are incredibly unhealthy telling me how to live a healthy life. And so I just I threw that out. I said, I'm not listening to you for help. I'll come to you when I need fixing, but I'm not going to come to you for help. So, of course, there's a number of people out there. I mean, thousands and thousands of practitioners that have been silenced by mainstream media and by the pharmaceutical companies because they speak out against that. And I read a lot of them. I focus on that. But... You know, going back to my story, about a year ago, a little over a year ago now, my wife and I are working out. We have our gym in our garage and we do burpees and we work out three or four times a week. And all of a sudden I start getting chest pains. And it's the, you know, I didn't really like this too much. So they finally, after months and months and months of waiting, I finally got in to get tested. And in that time, I had many bouts with chest pain, nothing that sent me to the ER. I don't go, I don't do something like that unless it's really serious. And so we finally got tested and they did a CT scan. We did um, ultrasounds in my heart. And they found out that I had some, some blockages in my heart. So they ended up doing what's called an angiogram. And they put a catheter up my arm all the way into my heart and checked out my heart. And they said, yeah, you're, you have what's called a coronary total occlusion, which means that there's you know, the coronary arteries are not getting blood everywhere they need on my heart. So technically my heart muscle could be dying. And the angina, the pain that I'm experiencing is it doesn't happen. It wouldn't happen unless I was really working out. So we have these things called collaterals that go around the side of our heart. So if our main artery is blocked going into the heart and you know, in the coronary arteries, the collaterals are like the little the side streets around the highway. They can still yeah. get you where you want to go, but they're not as big as the highway. So when I was having this chest pain, that's what was happening is I was working out so much that the pressure or the blood flow was constricted and it, it caused me to get this pain. So long story short, we ended up doing an angioplasty. They got through that and it's all good and I can have the blood flow. Um, but the doctors, you know, to this day, they still don't acknowledge. They're saying, okay, I'll just go back on the statins for the cholesterol because that's what's causing it. But that's, you know, there are people that have plenty of, that have high cholesterol that don't have heart issues. There are people that have heart issues that don't have high cholesterol. There's people that are on statins that still die from heart attacks, right? So there's all of the other, you know, unknowns. And so that's why I go on this health journey. But yeah, you're, you're exactly right going back to it. You know, I, I should have flatlined probably three or four times in the last year. And both cardiologists that I've spoken with said that most people that have my condition don't make it past 30. So the fact that I'm here in my 40s is, you know, a testament to eating healthy and staying fit as much as I possibly can. But we still want to make sure that that continues. Right. And so taking your health seriously is vitally important. Right. Because you never know what's actually lurking underneath the, the surface that we're not aware of. Real quickly, can you just share with us some of the things that you eat and the exercise that you do so someone listening can have an idea of what they can look to get into? Yeah. So I um, I, I do, I generally don't eat breakfast. I'll do bulletproof coffee. So I'll have 
MCT oil and uh, cacao in uh, and maca in my coffee in the morning. That Sounds generally good. sustains me until about 1, 2 p.m. Um, in the afternoon, I'll have protein and salad for lunch. So I'll have either chicken or steak or something like that in a salad. And then dinner time, you know, again, we try and do, if we can, we do as much salmon as we can, you know, get, um, fresh water or sorry, salt water, not farmed. We never do farmed anything. Farm stuff is terrible. Um, try to stay away from anything that is not grass fed when it comes to beef and, and things like that. But yeah, I try to eat mostly organic. It's not always possible, unfortunately. And then grass fed, open range, pasture raised, um, animal products, and then a lot of fish, you know, oh, um, you know, free range fish and things like that. Not free range, that's the wrong word for it, but wild caught is the best word for it. And as far as workouts go, and, and so the big thing is eliminating sugar, right? That And that's hard. I have a sweet tooth, so that's really, really hard. But eliminating sugar is like the, the most important thing I would say that anyone can do for their health. I mean, you know, between that and smoking, I don't know which one's worse for you long term. But those, those would be the big ones. Um, but then when it comes to workouts, so we have a full gym in our garage. And I, I will do high intensity interval training with my wife. And I do low weight, high rep when it comes to my weight workouts, we do full body workouts every single week. So do a pretty good job of maintaining the muscle as best we can. And I can keep up with all the kids that I coach in little league and so on. So I don't have to worry too much about them outrunning me or picking on me. And how do you feel right now as a healthy person doing all these things, the diet, the exercise, I'm pretty sure you're getting rest and water and fresh air and all of that stuff. So how do you feel? Oh yeah. <clears throat> No, I feel fine. Um, you know, again, even when I was having the issues, I would only feel that when I was working out and doing some heavy workouts. So even just natural state homeostasis, I'm, I'm fine. But, you know, when it comes down to it, we still don't have all the answers, right? And that's the part where I realized that science has failed us a little bit. And we don't do root cause analysis. Like, for example, when people die of a heart attack, you know, there's a lot of different causal factors. Sure. And we've done a really terrible job of figuring out what all those are. Of course, we figured out smoking was like one of the biggest causes of not just lung cancer, but cardiovascular disease. That's the biggest one. The next big one for cardiovascular disease is actually stress, right? Stress and inflammation. Yes. And people don't want to acknowledge that. They want to say it's cholesterol. Well, stress and inflammation are the biggest causes of all disease. And when I say inflammation, I'm not talking about just physical inflammation where your body just feels inflamed, but we actually have cellular inflammation and things like that. And so th again, I'm not a doctor, so I can't speak as an authority on this stuff, but I've been studying it for over 20 years now. So I've got a, I built up a pretty good repository of information, but those all come down to proper diet. Are you eating healthy? Are you sleeping enough? Are you drinking lots of water? And are you taking care of yourself? Right. Yes. And as an entrepreneur, um, you know, that's hard sometimes, right? Because you do want to work all day long and you feel like if I just get one more thing done tonight, then I'll be better off and I'll be able to make more money. And once I make the money, I'll buy the organic stuff. And once I have more time, I'll go to the gym and I'll work out. But this geez, one. that I hate to say it, but you know, as optimistic as we might be and we think in, in 12 months, everything's gonna be better. It might take 12 years for yes. some people or it may never happen. They have to go back to work and now all of a sudden they're 20, 30 pounds heavier. Um, don't be that person, right? Like really focus on your health before anything else. I would like to just recommend two books before we leave. Um, they're from Ellen G. White. She's the one that said that you shouldn't eat cheese even before, from like 1850. She was saying cheese is bad for you. You know that once you put cheese in your stomach, it takes like 12 hours to digest. And any food that's in there mm -hmm. with the cheese, the bun, the biscuit, whatever it is, the bread, it's gonna stay in there for 12 hours. The problem is that it might take 30 minutes to start digesting, so what happens? fermentation, cancer, etc. Two books. Um, Ministry of Healing by Ellen G. White and from the same author, Ellen G. White, um, Councils on Diets and Food. I believe that you'll find those books helpful. I'm going to have to spread those down right now. Looking back, we had a really good talk. You were very inspirational, very, ed very educational. Sometimes I have these tongue twisters. They're so amazing. Very educational. I enjoyed the time. I would love to have you on. I'm thinking of having a panel discussion next time. I'm not sure who I will have, but is it okay for me to reach out to you just to have a panel Absolutely. discussion? Absolutely. 
there we go i'll have you on thank you for that how did you enjoy today's talk that was great Jabez. i really appreciate it and you have great questions so wonderful thank you for that i appreciate it now given your time this is a tradition for the podcast as we look to grow and get more guests on given your experience on the podcast today if you could suggest or request let's say request because we're going to try to get this person on if you could request that we get one person on the podcast who would that person be and for this person what is one question that you would like to ask that person and have them answer when we get them on we'll ask them for you oh well see that's funny so i would say um you know we talked a lot about robert kiyosaki you might as well try and get him on right and um, you know the the biggest question i would have for robert <clears throat> you know and he I, i've actually asked him this question i haven't gotten an answer um <laughs> what was the name of rich dad <laughs> right <laughs> you know i never i never actually got the guy's name um that would be something i'd love to know but in all seriousness i think someone like like robert right especially having gone through what he did and becoming financially free by the time he was 45 and this is long before the internet was around would be what would be the advice you know, and you, you've asked this question of me as well but what would be the advice you would say for somebody to just again going back to the thing that i suggested cover their bases with income so that they can scale. like how would you suggest somebody go about doing that because I feel like that is something that so many entrepreneurs these days miss. They all see these Silicon Valley darlings and they want to go build the next, you know, rocket ship. They want to be the next Elon Musk or next you know, Uber or whatever. And it's like, you don't need that. You really don't need that. It's okay to be the auto mechanic in your town that works two or three days a week because you've got a thriving auto shop and you can spend three or four days a week or more with your family or doing something else, building something else, right? And so I that think would be the, my, my question for, for someone like Robert. And I think the best person who, um, I would say echo this sentiment is Gary Vaynerchuk. He says that it's perfectly fine to drive a Toyota Corolla and have a four bedroom house with your wife and kids making $40,000 a year. Money is not everything. I love the question that you asked. When you were speaking about it, I also had an answer to that. Do you want me to just give a brief answer you evaluate it, and then we close off in terms sure. of how to get that business? Sure. All right. So for an entrepreneur looking to start a big business, before you get there, you want to start something that covers the bills and gives you peace of mind and flexibility. That's the, the question. The answer I would say is that you have to do two things. The first is that you have to learn a very high income skill that could be copywriting, SEO, e-commerce, if you are a professional, you're an accountant, you are, let's say, a lawyer, you can go the other way in that you hire other competent people. So that's the product delivery, the service delivery that you're going to do here. That's something that you're going to give up. And when you learn a high income skill, you're not going to be the one providing the services. It's just allowing you the lens to evaluate talent to provide that. So you have the product and service delivery part ready. The next thing that you need is a system. You're going to have to read books. And the reason you're going to read books is you're going to learn how to ensure that the people who know what you know are doing what you can do at the highest level. And from there, you can build a very simple business that's bringing in 10K in profits per month. That can happen within a year. That would be my answer. Very simple, not detailed, but that's a general framework I would have in mind. What are your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, you know, going back to it, I was saying... My biggest challenge in growing a business has become is, is being the expert at the thing, right? Mm -hmm. But when you're getting started, you need to be the expert, right? So if you are the expert, people will pay you expert level fees. And for example, I consult with big businesses and I understand I know more about their marketing and their technology than they do most of the time, right? So that's an example of where being the expert is very, very valuable and you can get a six figure, seven figure retainer for something like that. Um, you know, and our clients pay us six figures to help them with their marketing systems. Mm -hmm. So being the expert is not the end all be all if you're trying to build a giant business, but it's a great thing to do to start getting yourself that financial freedom. And the important part is that as the expert, you're just going to oversee a team of people learning from you to do the same thing that you're the expert on. It has yep. been wonderful. 
It has been wonderful, Jeff. You are one of the most amazing persons I've met in business. I love entrepreneurship. I love business. The reason why I started the Boardroom Podcast on Zelhan is because I believe that if more people had the lessons that you've taught us today, they would make a lot less mistakes and do more of the right things. And if we can impact more small businesses, the corporations are fine. They'll probably never go broke. But if we can impact the small business owners and help them make an extra 20K, save an extra 20% or something that helps them on your journey to success, then how many people can we reach? Thank you for helping us with that goal. You've been wonderful. We'll have you on again on that panel discussion in the future. That sounds great, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Have a wonderful day. Cheers. Take care.